How do you turn a bottle of this into parts like this? Apparently dark magic. Welcome back to Cloud42, I'm James. Well, today we have a new tool in the shop, a resin 3D printer. If you've been around the channel for a while, you know that I have a number of filament-based 3D printers that I use to make all manner of things, but I have never used a resin 3D printer. So today we will take a look at the differences, put it to work making a real part for the lathe, and uh, maybe pick up some tips and tricks that could shorten your learning curve if you decide to get into resin 3D printing. I've been wanting to try out a resin 3D printer for a while, so I reached out to Elegoo and I asked them if they would be willing to send me one, and they said sure. They sent me this. This is the Elegoo Mars 2 Pro. Uh, they do have a larger one, which is what I was initially interested in, called the Saturn, but uh, they are just unobtainium right now. Apparently they're having trouble keeping up with production and they're out of stock everywhere. So uh, this is, they also sent me the Mercury Plus Wash and Cure Station. We'll talk a little bit more about that in a little bit. But let's take a look at the anatomy of a resin 3D printer. So all resin 3D printers are more or less the same. Um, they have a vat with a clear bottom that uh, holds a liquid resin. And there's an LCD screen underneath that that exposes the bottom layer of resin through the vat using ultraviolet light. So this one has a monochrome LCD screen. Uh, some of the older ones had full color LCD screens just using off the shelf parts. But if you use a mono screen, uh, you can get more efficient light transmission because you don't have different layers in there for the different colors. And you don't need them anyway because you're just trying to either pass or block ultraviolet light. The printer also has a build platform, and this is just an aluminum platform that can be leveled very precisely so that it can be layered down or laid down against the bottom of the vat, and it has a slightly roughened aluminum surface. So what happens is the printer lowers this down to where it is one layer thickness above the bottom of the vat, and then it exposes the resin that's between the build plate and the bottom of the vat and hardens it in a particular shape, depending on what you're trying to print, then it raises it up, sets it back down one layer higher, exposes the next layer, and then just keeps working that way, growing your part out of the liquid resin in the vat. Now, because of this, because the resin is hardening between the build plate and the plastic sheet, this is a material called FEP, uh, commonly just referred to as FEP, that's stretched tight like a drum across the bottom of the vat, the resin is cured in contact with this, so it sticks to it. So for every layer, you're gonna end up with the resin stuck to the bottom of the build plate and stuck to the bottom of the vat, and then when it lifts, you have a tug of war. And you want the build plate to win, and you want the model to hold together as it gets bigger and bigger, it has to be strong enough to pull and peel it off of the FEP sheet here on the bottom. And in my experience playing around with this printer and doing some initial printing, that is the hardest part, is getting it so that the build plate and the part always win that tug of war against the FEP sheet. Now there are a couple of tricks that I learned along the way. I had a whole bunch of print failures. Every time I tried to print, I basically just ended up with a layer of resin stuck to the FEP sheet because it started printing, it peeled off, it stuck to the bottom, and I just could not get anywhere with it. And I finally picked up a tip from another video on YouTube, and that is this stuff. This is a dry lube with PTFE. PTFE is Teflon. And so if you put a little bit of this on the bottom of this sheet, it reduces friction and reduces the ability of the resin to stick. And so actually treating the bottom of my vat with this stuff is ultimately what saved it. And I started getting successful prints after I did that. Did a couple of other things that I will also show, but this stuff is just magic. Is there a problem with having this in the bottom of the vat? Is that going to affect the resin? I have no idea but I couldn't get a successful print without it, so uh, I probably will never find out, but it seems to work just fine. So all you do is just take a rag and put just a little bit of this on, 
So I've just got a little wet spot there. And then I'm just going to rub this on the bottom of the, uh, of the, uh, the tank here, bottom of the vat and rub this in. I'm not interested in getting it wet. I'm just interested in getting full coverage and buffing it in so that I've got some of that PTFE material on the entire bottom of this thing. And it needs to be dry. You don't want any liquid in here. You don't want to spray it in here. You don't want a bunch of stuff that's going to contaminate. You just want a thin, thin layer on the bottom of the vat. And that's it. It should be completely invisible. It shouldn't be able to see anything there. And now that is ultimately what I did. And I did that once. I just did it again to show you. But I did it once and have done several prints from what I hear, what I've been told. You can print virtually forever with just one treatment, probably until you have to replace the FEP sheet just from wear over time. So what kind of materials do you use in a printer like this? Uh, you use what's called photopolymer resin, and I have a couple of different types here. Now, I ultimately bought the Elegoo branded resins uh, just because it's an Elegoo printer, and uh, I don't uh, have any particular belief that this resin is better or worse than any other resin. I just wanted to use the manufacturer's resin so that if I had some kind of a problem, I could call them up and say, hey, I'm having a problem, I'm using your printer, I'm using your resin, what gives, help me. Um, and uh, and in, in fact, I did have a bunch of trouble and had some contact with them. They weren't a ton of help. Turns out there's a lot of great resources out on YouTube that ended up being much more helpful. So uh, I have two kinds here. I have uh, what's called ABS-like and what's called standard. Now the standard is a very rigid material. It's very brittle, but because it's so rigid, it can represent very fine details. So if you're trying to build an army for your tabletop RPG games, this is probably the stuff you're looking for, especially if you're gonna paint it. Um, if you're trying to build engineering parts, this is what I chose to start with. They call it ABS-like. This isn't ABS, but it has a little bit more impact resistance and a little bit more flexibility, and so this should stand up better for places where I need an engineering resin to make functional mechanical parts. Time will tell, but this is what I started with. Now, the flexibility also comes with a little bit of difficulty in printing because as it lays down these 50 micron layers, they're flexible, and so the dynamics of that trying to pull off of the FEP sheet is a little bit different than it would be if it were rigid, and we'll talk more about that. Uh, there's no getting around the fact this stuff smells bad. And when you have an open vat of it and when it's printing, that smell gets into the air. Uh, depending on how much ventilation you have, it could be really bothersome for you or it could be no big deal. I don't find it to be that big of a deal, but I also don't run the printer and then sit right next to it for four or five hours while it's running. Um, we actually have uh, an extra bathroom that I put these in on the counter in there so I could turn on the vent fan. That works great, um, but an open window would work well. Just beware of UV light. Stray ultraviolet light will cure this stuff. The cover um, on the printer and the dark bottle should protect it, but in general, keeping it away from ultraviolet light as much as you can is probably best. Of course, to test out the new printer, we're going to need a part to print. For my electronic lead screw on my lathe, I use an Omron encoder to keep track of the position of the spindle that's driven by a GT2 pulley. And up to this point, I have just had it mounted on a little uh, Noga Popeye magnet with a little 3D printed part that I made to hold this in position. And it just sticks to the metal case, uh, metal frame of the lathe and you can just position it into the right position to tension up the belt. And I have long wanted to do something nicer, but I haven't gotten around to it. Well. Today's the day. So here is the new mount, and you can see it will have a couple of slots in it for screws to mount it to the frame of the lathe, and it holds the encoder in the same position with the same pulley. It's open so that we can get the belt in there over it, but it's also enclosed, so when this is mounted on the side of the lathe, it'll protect you know things from falling into the mechanism, but still give visibility to get to the and access to the screw to adjust the pulley height. And this is the part that we're going to make. Now, in order to slice this up, we just need to save it as an STL file. And the easiest way to do that is just to say 3D print, select the part, select my options here. And instead of sending it to my normal 3D print utility, I'll just uncheck that and we'll save the file to disk. 
This is the slicing software that came with the printer. It's called Chitubox or Chitubox. Uh, I don't really know how it's pronounced or particularly care. Let me drag in the STL file that we just exported. And here it is. I can click with the left mouse button to pan around, click with the right mouse button to drag and rotate. Now, the first thing I want to do is get this position to print. We can do that with the rotate and move tools over here. I'll click on rotate and uh, the green is Y. I'm just going to say, just click the 45 degree button until I have it pretty much upright. Now, this is the way I would probably print this if I were on an FDM printer, just right on the bed. And then we'd arrange some kind of support for the top here and that would be fine. But on a resin printer, these bottom layers that stick to the bed are going to be distorted. There's a phenomenon called elephant's foot where they're expanded a little bit. There are various ways to deal with that, but in general, you wanna raise it up off of the bed. And when you do that, the, you then have a big flat area of the print. In my experience, that's pretty difficult for these printers to manage, to have a big flat area that gets built directly on top of the supports. Anything overhang like that, especially this big flat level area, is gonna create a lot of surface area that's gonna to stick to the FEP sheet and it's gonna be particularly difficult to manage without anything behind it, but just the points of the support. So in general, you want to tilt this up. And uh, the angle that's usually recommended is uh, 60 degrees. So let me click this, that'll go 45. I'll go ahead and just say minus 60. Um, I'm not sure what's really that magical about 60 degrees, but that's what's been recommended. That's what I'm going to uh, use here. I'm going to use the mouse wheel here to zoom out a little bit so we can see what's going on. And now let's talk about building support. So we'll go over here and click on the support tab. And the first thing that it does is it puts in a raft underneath it. We can choose the Z lift height, how high we want it up. And I want it up five millimeters. And let me just reset all of the support settings to defaults. Okay, little trick here. When you change settings here, like if I wanted to make the raft thicker, let's run this up, make it five millimeters thick so it's real easy to see. You note that it hasn't updated here. If I just click back to the model list and back to support, it updates. Um, I don't know why it does that, but that's, how, that's a little quirk in the software. Let me reset all this. And let's talk about the default kind of a raft that it designs. The raft is the big flat area that's going to connect to the bed and give you the bed adhesion to get to stick to the build platform. Remember, this is being built upside down, hanging from the build platform. So you can imagine this being upside down. And so as this prints, we can kind of look at this layer by layer. It's going to print the first layer that's going to stick to the bed. And then it's going to, let me zoom in here. It's gonna print up one layer at a time, and you can see that as it goes up, each layer is wider than the layers below it. And even worse, as you get up to about this point, not only do you have it angling out unsupported, you then have a hollow here on the top. And keep in mind, this is gonna be upside down against the FEP sheet in the bottom of the vat. So if this material is very, very rigid, then you might get away with this. But if this is flexible at all, like even the way ABS is flexible, what you've done is you've built a suction cup here. So this hollow in the top is going to be full of fluid. And so this edge is gonna seal it down against the FEP sheet. And as you start to pull, it'll flex. Rather than peeling off of the FEP sheet, this is gonna flex just like a suction cup. And this, in my experience, is going to grip and it's going to break the adhesion on the build platform and you are gonna end up with something that looks very much like this, adhered to the bottom of the vat and no part. I have no idea why they chose to do this, but we can make a few changes here. Uh, first thing is I want as much surface area as I can get. I'm gonna go ahead and run this up to say maybe 150%. That will make it physically larger than the part. And the raft thickness, I'm gonna go ahead and just set this to two millimeters, and I'm gonna set the raft height also to two millimeters. So what that does, if I click out and back, is now there's no suction cup here 
because the raft height and the raft thickness are the same. And then I'm going to change the slope. So instead of having this 30 degree overhang, I'm going to set this up to 75 degrees, which makes the sidewall here almost vertical. It's enough that I still have something to pry with, but now we have basically a flat slab that's going to sit down on the build platform and it's going to be rigid. There's no suction cup effect. And I have had much more success with a raft that looks like this. Uh, because you don't, it just it reduces the adhesion to the uh, to the FEP sheet, and so you're much better off when you get into the tug of war between the build platform and the FEP. The build platform wins. Okay, so now we've got a raft to build on to adhere this to the build platform, and now we just need to put in supports. Now we have different presets in here: light, medium, and heavy, and that just has to do with how thick these are. I played around with the light and medium, and every time uh, I ended up with them ripping and tearing off of the part, I'm sure there are ways to be successful for this. But if you're just starting out, I think over support is the way to go so you can get some successful prints and get some experience with your printer, and then play with this stuff over time as you kind of get a better idea of what you're doing. At least that's how I plan to play it. So we can start with just the defaults. So if we go over here, you see down here this plus platform and plus all that will add supports to the platform or add supports, uh, just the supports that go down to the platform or supports that would end up inside the part. I'm just going to say plus all and let's just see what it does by default. So this has now put in the support that it thinks that it needs. And that's based on this density value. So density value, I think the defaults, let's just go ahead and reset this to defaults. Hit plus all again. This is what it puts in by default. This is with a density of 50%. Now I didn't feel like these were enough supports to hang on to. At least I wanted to do something a little bit uh, more rigid than that. So I've of course selected the heavy supports and I increased this uh, density to 85%. Get plus all again, redo the support, and this gives me something that's got quite a few more points of support along the edges here that I felt would be able to hang on to it better. Is this over supported? Yeah, yeah, it's probably over supported. But let's take a look at exactly what's happening. Now you can't just look at it the way it is at the end. You have to look at it as it's being built. So as this is being built up, the very first part of the part is being printed right here between these supports. And as it comes up higher, it intersects with more and more of those support posts. But the very bottom point where it first starts to print, I've got three supports that it's going to touch. And so this is going to be able to be printed and supported as we go. That looks pretty good. Now, the one thing that I see here that I don't like is as this goes up, you can see that it's supported down here and it's printing and moving off to the left. And the higher it goes, the further and further off to the left, again, the main support point is down here, but the actual point where it's contacting the FEP sheet and getting torque applied to it is way to the left. And it's all the way to here before we get any more support. So I feel like we need to have some more support in this area. So I'm going to go ahead and just click along here and just add some more support. And am I over supporting it? Of course. Uh, but at this point where I'm just starting out, I've had enough failures that I really want to make sure that this thing is sticking. So right over here is another area where I'm going to be start where I'm going to start printing in midair. And you can see that part just shows up. That's probably way too much support, but we'll go with that for now. We can always sand off any uh, imperfections that are there. And we'll just see how this goes. And so then as this continues building up, everything comes back together and we're going to end up building the entire part. And that looks reasonable and it looks like a reasonable amount of material to remove. So let's see, we talked about the raft. We've got that in there. We talked about the heavy supports. We've got in that, that in there. We talked about increasing the density. I think this is all we need. So we can come back over here and look at the 
settings. Now the key print settings that you need are here in the print tab. We're doing with a 50 micron layer height. Bottom layer count is five. Now what happens here is the bottom layers are exposed longer than the rest of the layers uh, so that you get a really good cure and really good adhesion to the bed. And in this case, the bottom five layers are gonna be printed with an exposure time of 45 seconds. The rest of the layers will be printed with two and a half seconds each. And with these materials and this particular printer, two and a half seconds is plenty. If you have a printer that has a full color LCD that's not a monochrome LCD, you're probably gonna need longer exposure times, more like six or eight seconds, depending on the resin. With the monochrome printers, not just the Elegoo, but there are a whole bunch of them that use basically the same electronics. And two and a half seconds, at least with these resins, is plenty. Then the rest of this is mechanical. So after each layer, it's got to lift up to peel it off of the bed and you control how far it's going to lift. And I have this set to five millimeters, both for the bottom layers, that's the bottom five, and then all the rest of the layers, it'll lift five millimeters. Then you can control the lift speed and watching the printer, I think this is only controlling the lifting speed of the bottom three millimeters of those five. I don't totally get it. But if you have this too high, it's gonna yank it off the FEP sheet. If you run it slower, it has more of a chance to peel off of the FEP sheet. So this is something that you can tune. I think in the manual, they recommend as high as 90 millimeters a minute. I've got it just set to 60. I've had pretty good success with that. And then the retract speed is how much, it, how fast it moves after it gets peeled off, then it's gonna finish the lift and go right back down. The light off delay, I just left these at the defaults. This basically will allow you to introduce additional delay so that after the printer settles back down to print the next layer, it can give time for the resin to kind of flow and settle before it exposes it. Again, I just left this at the defaults. There's one other thing I've been playing with in here and that's this tolerance compensation. So inside holes, may end up printing smaller than you expect and the outside of the part may end up printing larger due to light bleed and so this is how much the ultraviolet light that's being masked off by the lcd to expose a certain area of the resin some of that light or some of the uh, chemical reaction can bleed into adjacent areas and make the part bigger or make holes smaller and so these values are in here so that you can compensate for that I've been playing with it a little bit. Um, I, I, I don't have a strong opinion about this. These were just sort of measured values that I put back in here. I haven't done a lot of follow-up, but these are here if you want to tune. And uh, they have a different set of values you could use for the bottom layers. Maybe you could compensate for the elephant's foot. I'm not sure. I haven't played with this enough, but know that those are in there. So I think that's it. I'll just click slice. And what this has done is it's gone through and created the images that will be displayed on the LCD for each layer. So the very bottom layer is gonna expose this big area for the raft, and then the next and the next and the next, and so on all the way up. So this is essentially the image that's going to appear on the LCD, and the wide areas are the areas of the resin that's going to be exposed in each layer. This all looks perfectly reasonable and we don't have any areas that are suddenly starting to build out in free space with no support underneath them. So I think we're good. And we'll just save this file, put it on a thumb drive and take it out to the printer. So we've got the printer here. The first thing we need to do is we need to level the build plate and make sure that it is perfectly flat with the glass. And we're gonna do that with a couple of pieces of just ordinary printer paper. The head of the machine has a couple of screws that lock the build plate into position and we will just go ahead and loosen those. As soon as we do that, the build plate will lock down and it's flexible. So I'll try to get it kind of squared up here. And then on the control panel, we'll go to tools, manual, and home. This is all described in the manual and it has pictures, so. Okay, there we go. So I've raised it. Both of these, I feel a little bit of grip on it, but they're relatively loose. 
manual tells you to have it pretty tight. Um, I find that when I do that, then when this comes down and presses against the bottom of the FEP sheet, when it's in there, the whole column flexes a little bit. So I think having it a little bit looser, that's about right. So then I will come down here and I will set Z equals zero. And then we will raise this up. 100 millimeters just to get it out of the way. Okay, now we are ready to put the vat back and just wanna make sure we don't have dust or anything on the bottom of this to interfere with the UV exposure or also to uh, prop up that flexible plate. I mean, it's the, the FEP is, it's like a drum and I want it tight against the LCD glass if I can get it that way. Put this in, tighten down the screws. Now I'll just put some resin in the vat and honestly, it doesn't take that much. Let's take a brief moment here to talk about safety. Liquid resin is toxic. Don't touch it, don't breathe it, don't taste it to see if it's fresh, don't do it. You'll note in the video that I'm not wearing gloves. I've chosen instead to set up a process that allows me to do everything I need to do without touching the resin. Everything I'm touching is clean and I'm using tools and opposable thumbs to keep it that way. That being said, this isn't a how-to, it's a what did. If you feel more comfortable with gloves, it's a great option. Just be careful that you're not picking up resin on the gloves and spreading it all over everything without realizing it. And if you do get a little bit on you, just wash up with soap and water and uh, change your process so it doesn't happen again. There is a max fill line in here, but in my experience, you don't need to be anywhere even close to that, unless you're printing something really big that's gonna take a lot of resin. We've already treated the FEP sheet in order to try to make it a little more slippery so that the part will come off. Now we're gonna do something to try to make the part stick better. Now, when this lowers into the resin, it's gonna go through you know, any bubbles or anything else that's going on in here. So I can kind of knock some of that down. But ultimately, if we can get the resin in intimate contact with the, uh, with the rough surface of this sheet, we're gonna be better off. So I'm just gonna go through here. I'm just gonna butter up the bottom of this sheet with resin just to make sure we have it in intimate contact and pressed into all the little voids on the bottom of this uh, build plate. The last thing you want is for this to come down and get a bubble trapped under there so you don't really get good fusion against the plate. And uh, doing this in addition to treating the FEP sheet with the PTFE lubricant completely solved the bed adhesion problems that I was having. And that's it. We should now be ready to print. Don't worry about getting uh, resin on top of the plate. It's gonna push down and you're gonna end up with resin on top anyway. And I've got my flash drive that has my file on it. So go back to the main menu, say print, locate the file we wanna print and hit go. Now the print needs to be washed in isopropyl alcohol to remove any liquid resin that's still on the surface. And we're gonna do that with this. This is the uh, Mercury Plus washing station that I got with the printer. And this serves two purposes. This is a wash and cure station. There's a little turntable in the bottom here that serves two purposes. You can put a platform on it to slowly rotate in front of these ultraviolet LEDs for curing the print, but it also can spin quickly and turn an impeller a magnetic impeller that's in the bottom of the wash tank. So I've got about two and a half liters of 99% isopropyl alcohol in here, and we will use that to wash the print. Now, I filled this with nice, fresh, clear IPA just for you guys so that you could actually see what's happening. After you use it once or twice, it starts to get cloudy, still works just fine. And eventually when it gets too dirty and has too much resin in it, you could either let it sit for a while and the resin will actually precipitate out or you can set this out in the sun or use the washing station I suppose and cure the resin with ultraviolet light and then it will precipitate out 
you can decant off the clean isopropyl alcohol and you can reuse it. I haven't run enough prints through this for that to be a problem yet, so I've just got clean IPA in here just so that you can see what's happening. Now, the, the thing I love about the washing station is you normally would have to take the build plate out and clean it and have a tub and brushes and other kinds of stuff to mess with that. With this, you can take the entire build plate off, put it right into the isopropyl alcohol, never touch it until after it's clean. So let's do that. So pull this off and it comes with a little bracket here. And this bracket, you can adjust the height up and down depending on how deep your alcohol is and how large your model is. I'll just kind of set it here near the top. Now I'm gonna pull this off and try to get it right over the alcohol so that we don't drip anything. Just gonna set it on the bracket here and then plunge the whole thing down into the IPA. And make sure the height looks good. And yeah, we've got plenty of height. The whole uh, platform with resin on it, I can adjust it here. It's below the top of the alcohol and the part is well above the bottom of the tank. Put the cover on and I'm gonna put the cover back over here just to prevent stray ultraviolet light from affecting that resin. Set the mode to stir and let's start with two minutes. And hit go. And that's it, it's clean. And let's look at the part. That looks like pretty much exactly what we modeled. Now this is not cured fully. This is still, I don't know what the right word is, I'd call it green. Uh, the resin is cured enough to hold its shape, but it's not very hard yet. Trigger warning. I'm about to handle the washed parts before the final cure. The safety of this is apparently disputed. Some sources say it's fine, others express concern, mostly people who sell plant-based eco resins, so draw your own conclusions. But if you wanna wear gloves for this operation, I think that's a great thing, especially if you have to do this on a regular basis. However, that's not what I did, so feel free to rage down in the comments because frankly, it drives up my engagement metrics. Now we could go ahead and remove these supports just by snapping them off now, or we could cure it first and then try to cut them off cleanly. And there's a bunch of ways you can do this. You can just come in here with side cutters and just flush cut all of these, uh, all the supports, or you can just pull and they'll just pop right off as well. Now this part is clean, but the resin isn't fully set up. It feels, I wouldn't call it sticky. It's not really tacky. It's something else. It's, it feels almost soft, um, which is probably exactly what's going on. So let's put our platform there, put in the part. Now let's switch this to curing mode and let's start with two minutes. I put the cover on. This will also protect our eyes from the UV. And go. So the, the ultraviolet LEDs on the back are just providing additional exposure time to the resin and uh, curing it up, hardening it further. Manual doesn't give a lot of information on how to do this. I just kind of run it until it starts to feel not tacky. And generally two minutes maybe three or four if I feel, you know, like I really want to make sure it's cured and that's plenty. You can also do this in the sun. You don't need the washing station, but it is so simple to pull the whole build platform off and just clean it all at once that I don't know why you wouldn't want this. Okay, that's finished. Oh yeah, and that feels much better. The bottom still feels slightly tacky. I'm gonna go ahead and flip it over and just run it a couple minutes on the other side as well. Maybe another minute. 
Well, after just a little bit more cleaning up, here is the part. I did take some sandpaper and kind of hit some of the rough edges. Um, I don't know that I would do that again. It probably doesn't matter. If I were gonna paint this, I would definitely sand it down and make it perfectly smooth, but just as a functional part uh, on a machine, it should be fine. Let me put it down here where you can see the surface texture. And you can see the, the, the texture of this. Of course, this is printed at an angle, but you just don't really even see the layer lines. You kind of can feel it. Let's see, can you hear it? Yeah, not really. Um, and I, I'm, I'm pretty pleased with this. If you look at the bottom, you can actually see some of the places where the support was attached and it leaves little holes where it breaks away. But all in all, the surface finish of the part, especially compared to an FDM printer, is just amazing. And the kind of geometries you can get with the uh, scaffold style support um, it's a lot easier to do crazy stuff and get the, um, get the support actually broken off of the part in a reasonable way. This is another part that I successfully printed on this printer. This is a cradle to hold my cell phone in the car and it's got a little port here where I put a charging cable through it and screws to mount it to a uh, bracket that I have in there that, that I 3D printed that replaces the coin drawer in the dash of the car. So I can just slot my cell phone in there and it's up where I can use it for navigation. I actually previously, my previous two cell phones that I had in there, I printed these on my FDM printer. This is PETG and of course it works exactly the same, but you know, you can see the surface texture, you can see the layer lines, and this is just a completely different animal in terms of just how smooth it is, how soft it feels to the touch. Time will tell if this material holds up, but I've had no trouble with ABS, I've had no trouble with PETG in the environment of the car. I don't expect any trouble with this, quote, ABS-like resin, but we will see. Now you've seen a couple of successful prints. I've also had a lot of frustration getting this thing going. The tug of war that happens between the build plate and the, and the FEP sheet is just, it's a learning curve that I was not expecting. And I had a lot of failures. This was another attempt at, uh, at this part and it did not go well. It ended up only sticking on one corner. Everything was drooping and hanging down. And uh, of course the print failed. This is you know unusable, but this one at least stayed mostly stuck to the build plate. I had a lot of other parts that didn't. So this is the raft of a print that stuck to the build plate long enough to get the raft. And then the suction cup shape that I was talking about earlier stuck to the FEP sheet. And so then this popped off and this was just in the bottom of the vat with a bunch of resin cured as all the additional exposures uh, were made on the bottom and this was stuck fast to the FEP sheet and I had to peel this off manually by like flexing the sheet from the bottom and still it was a bear to get off. Here's another failed print. I was trying to print a timing pulley like this one and uh, this one I was printing it so that the pulley should have been supported on a raft with some light supports underneath it and that didn't work out. It got as far as printing the raft and the support. The raft you can see is kind of warped a little bit but it did stay stuck to the bed and then it started printing the pulley and then it snapped off. It just tore the supports and then I found this part again stuck to the FEP sheet in the bottom. And I've just got a whole collection of these rafts that ended up stuck to the bottom of the vat and didn't successfully print. And I just went around and around and around with this until I ultimately did some research, discovered the dry lube PTFE, treated the bed with that and discovered sort of buttering up the build plate with resin before I started. And that more or less solved the problems along with getting the right exposures. So all in all, I am pretty pleased. I, it was a bigger learning curve than I expected. It was very frustrating for a little while, but now that I've got the sort of recipe worked out, I can make some pretty decent parts and I'm pretty pleased with it and I will keep playing with it. We will see how the resins stand up over time. I need to try some other resins. There's a whole world of stuff out there. Uh, not quite as many or as much variety as you can get with uh, FDM printers, but there are a bunch of things to try, some flexible filaments or flexible resins. I may play with those and time will tell how these materials compare to 
the materials that I'm used to using on the FDM printers. Well, that's all I have for you today. If you enjoyed this video, give it a thumbs up. Feel free to subscribe to the channel and leave me a comment. I'd like to know what you think. Thank you for watching. Thank <laughs> you.